There was a glimmer on the carpet in the end suite as I entered, a reflection of sunlight just beginning to make its way through the blinds. It didn't blind me, but it caught my attention. I looked down to see what it was. I was barefoot and didn't want to step on glass or anything sharp. Caroline hadn't mentioned that she had dropped anything in the bathroom, but who knew? I didn't see it at first, without the light shining on it. It was almost the same color as the carpet. Eventually, I found it. A tiny circle of foil that had fallen on the floor and reflected the light into my eyes as I entered the bathroom. I picked it up. It was the backing of a strip of pills, the little circle of foil that gets pressed out when you pop a pill out of the strip. Most times it stays attached to the strip, but occasionally, as in this case, it separates and falls to the floor. I examined it. On one side, it was blank, but on the other side, it had a marking. Tuesday. Since it was Wednesday, I presumed it was from Tuesday's pill, meaning that the pills had to be taken daily. I knew I wasn't taking any medication. I was 35 and fit as a flea, and so was my wife, Caroline. We had both recently undergone our yearly checkups and were pronounced fit and healthy. So why was there a pill cover in my bathroom? I knew there were several types of pills that needed to be taken daily, but the one that immediately came to mind was the contraceptive pill. Caroline was not on the contraceptive pill, or at least I thought she wasn't, since I had had a vasectomy two years ago following the birth of our second and last child. She had never had trouble with cramps or period pain, being one of the lucky women who sailed through her monthly cycle with no trouble whatsoever. So why the pills? I had to admit that my first thought was that she might have some kind of illness she didn't want to tell me about. My thoughts went to very dark places for a few minutes, but then I remembered the checkups and the fact we had shown each other the reports. We were both clear. If the little circle of foil was here, then it was likely that the tablets were here too. I closed and locked the door. Caroline was still in bed, and I began to search. It took me some time to find them but eventually I did. They were buried at the bottom of a box of tampons, inside an aspirin box. When I pulled the strip of pills out, I recognized them immediately as the same kind she used to take before my vasectomy, and even before that, between our kids, while we were not trying to conceive. Why was she back on the pill? I had only one answer available to that question. She was seeing someone else. Caroline and I had been together for nine years. I had just finished university training as an engineer, and she worked as a PA. We had met in a bar, and although we hadn't exactly hit it off immediately, there had been enough interest for her to accept my invitation to dinner. Caroline was tall, just about an inch short of my five feet ten inches. She was a former athlete and maintained an athletic physique with a lean frame. Her hips were my favorite part of her. We had courted for about a year and then got married when I was 26. Our two children were James, five, and Sonia, two, and I had the operation to prevent any further pregnancies. Two was our limit. We had the perfect set. Caroline had returned to work after maternity leave for each of the children, reluctant to leave a job she loved. We had an au pair who looked after the children during the day and went home at night. She was costing almost as much as Caroline was earning, but Caroline didn't care. She just wanted to be out of the house and working at the job she loved. I worked with a couple of buddies, having set up an engineering firm. Between us, we would never be rich, but we were all very comfortable. I teddied the bathroom, put her pills back where I had found them, and decided I needed to think. There was no point in confronting her now. I needed a plan. I needed proof. What would happen after that? I had no idea. Let's get all the facts first, and then see where that leads us. I went to work as usual and considered my options. Firstly, I wanted to know who and when. Also, how long had this been going on? Was it someone at work? Heaven forbid, her boss. Was it the person she had mentioned in passing? This led me to the next disturbing question. Were the kids even mine? All this time... I had not allowed emotion to get involved. I knew it would come, the feelings of loss, betrayal, hurt, and anger. 
But first, I needed to know if my suspicions were real. I was working on a problem and didn't yet have enough facts to draw any conclusions. I started with the internet, ordering some DNA testing kits. Testing the children would be straightforward. I often put them to bed before Caroline got home, so that part would be easy. I also ordered some surveillance equipment, a couple of small voice recorders to place in her car and her bag, and a few tiny cameras to hide around the house. I doubted she would engage in anything questionable in the house, given the au pair and the fact that she was rarely there when I wasn't. At least I didn't think she was. I needed access to her phone. I knew of a cloning tool that would allow me to get a copy of her phone, receive all her messages and emails, and even listen in on her calls. I had to buy another phone for that purpose. It took a few days for everything to arrive. During that time, I watched Caroline closely. She did nothing out of the ordinary. Our routine was typical, with occasional moments of intimacy, usually on weekends when we were both home. I never noticed anything suspicious about her behavior. She didn't show any signs of having a secret routine, nor did she seem unusually preoccupied when she returned home. Either she wasn't having an affair, or she was exceptionally careful about covering her tracks. On Friday morning, the packages arrived. I had them sent to my office to avoid any questions. I now had the DNA kits, voice recorders, several cameras, and the mobile phone cloning kit. That afternoon, I left the office early. When I got home, the au pair was feeding the kids their dinner, preparing them for bed. I let her handle that while I set up the cameras, one in the bathroom, one in the living room, and one in the bedroom with a clear view of the bed. I heard the children splashing in the bath and went to help get them ready for bed. I took Sonia, swabbed her cheek, and pocketed the swab. Then, I laid her down and read to her until she fell asleep. James was still awake when I looked in, and the au pair was still reading to him. I offered to take over so she could leave, and she gratefully accepted. James's swab took no time at all, and less than twenty minutes later, he too was fast asleep. I packaged the swabs, along with one taken from my own cheek, and placed them in the mailbox for the postman to collect in the morning. The service promised that the results would be available online within 48 business hours, so by Wednesday at the latest. Caroline came home exactly on time that evening, and we went through our usual routine. She told me about her day, and I told her about mine, neither of us really listening to the other. We had dinner, and then she went for a shower. I used that opportunity to plant the recorders in her car and bag into Clone's cell phone. I checked the clone to see if there were any incriminating texts or emails, but there were none. Either she was extremely careful, or she was not involved in anything inappropriate. I couldn't decide which. The weekend passed as it usually did. We had moments of intimacy on both mornings before the kids woke, a routine that had almost become ritualistic. Caroline had no calls or texts over the weekend, and since we spent all our time together, I had no chance to check if she was taking the tablets. However, I did notice that the strip of tablets was missing the days corresponding to those weekends. Since I wasn't taking them, it was a fair conclusion that she was. On Monday, I told Caroline I would be working from home. She went off to the office, and I took the opportunity to review the footage from the cameras. The bathroom camera confirmed that she was indeed taking the tablets, but the real surprise came from the bedroom camera. On Saturday evening, while I was cooking dinner, Caroline had gone for a shower. I saw her in the bedroom using a phone to text someone. There had been nothing on the phone I cloned, so she must have had a second phone. It certainly hadn't been in her bag, so where was it? I watched as she finished texting, and then went over to the air conditioning unit. She released the catch, opened it, and stashed the phone inside. Immediately, I went and checked the duct, but found no phone there. She must have hidden it when she was home but took it with her when she left. I needed access to that phone. It was the first piece of concrete evidence that she was involved in something. Although I still wasn't sure what, the indications were clear that she was hiding something. I watched the footage of her getting dressed that morning and saw her remove the phone from the air conditioning unit and slip it into her bag before leaving for the day. 
I needed that phone. That night, when she came home, I watched her carefully. She dropped her bag in the hallway and continued with her usual nighttime routine. After dinner, she went for a shower. I checked her bag, but the phone wasn't there. She must have taken it with her and hidden it in the air conditioning unit when she went upstairs. What she didn't realize or didn't care about was that the other side of the vent opened into Sonia's room. Quietly listening for the shower, I crept into my daughter's bedroom and opened the vent from her side. There was the phone. I grabbed it and took it to my office, clumbing it to the new phone in just a few minutes. I returned it and had just about closed the vent when I heard my wife come out of the shower. I went and sat by Sonia's bed, gently stroking her hair. When my wife came in, she asked quietly if something was the matter. I shook my head and whispered that I liked to come and sit with one or the other of them from time to time, just to remind myself how lucky I am to have two such wonderful kids. She smiled and said, You old softy, and suggested we head out before I woke her. I didn't get to look at the clone phone until the next day. That was when my world seemed to collapse. The sound of the intercom from my secretary failed to penetrate as I sat in my office chair, staring at the clone phone, tears streaming down my face. Eventually, my secretary must have grown tired of trying to reach me and knocked briefly before entering my office. She poked her head around the door and saw me. Michelle, my secretary, was a no-nonsense woman who dressed far older than her years. I would place her between thirty and forty. She was slim with red hair and green eyes, always dressed conservatively in clothes that would have suited someone much older. Our relationship had always been strictly professional. I had never even raised an eyebrow in her direction. Michelle had previously made it clear that if one of my business partners didn't stop his inappropriate behavior, she would leave and sue the company for constructive dismissal and sexual harassment. She had stayed on because I had always treated her with respect, unlike others. My business partner was incensed by this and gave us an ultimatum. Either she went or he did. That was how I ended up owning 60% of the company instead of 40%. Seeing me upset, Michelle immediately withdrew to deal with whatever it was she had been trying to call me about. I heard voices in my outer office, then it went quiet. Michelle returned to my office, closed and locked the door, and sat down across from me. She pulled out some tissues from her ever-ready supply and handed them to me. I took them blindly and began to wipe at my eyes. Tell me, she said. I showed her the phone. There were text messages between Caroline and an unidentified party. The messages described clandestine meetings and intimate details that seemed to have been ongoing for a long time. The messages included personal details that only someone close would know, such as a specific mole and other intimate knowledge. I was not mentioned in any of the texts. It was as if I didn't exist. Do you know who she is involved with? Michelle asked, still all business. I shook my head. How did you find out? She inquired. I explained how I had found the small silver tab in the bathroom. Then the pills and how everything had unfolded from there. While I spoke, Michelle sat and looked at me, holding my hand. A gesture I realized was the first time we had ever touched. You need more information, she said. The DNA results for the children will be back on Wednesday. Can you hold it together until then? I don't know, I said. She nodded and informed me that our manufacturers in Portland needed to see me urgently. She had booked me on the next flight and I would be back on Thursday. I can't think about that just now, I said. Michelle took my phone, typed out a text message to Caroline, and sent it. There's been a mess up in Portland. I have to go and sort it out. I'll be back Thursday. Love you. Caroline's almost instant reply was, Okay, let me know when you get there. See you when you get back. Michelle looked at the phone for a second, her lip curling, then handed it back to me, and took out her own phone. Lorraine, she said, yes, thanks. You free this afternoon. After a brief exchange, she instructed me to get cleaned up. It was oddly reassuring to defer decisions and plans to someone else. When I came out of the bathroom, Michelle was holding my jacket. 
Where are we going? I asked. You have an appointment with an old friend of mine, she said. I followed along, and it turned out Lorraine was Michelle's best friend and also a divorce lawyer. She had handled Michelle's own divorce when her husband had been unfaithful. Michelle explained the situation to Lorraine while I sat there in a daze, unable to fully process what was happening. Lorraine, having dealt with similar situations many times, began outlining my options. Gary, she said, I'm just laying out your options. I'm not advocating for any just yet. That may come later. Your first option is to do nothing. She doesn't know you know. And from what I understand, you seem to have a perfectly happy life before, which doesn't have to change. You could keep on as if nothing happened, playing ignorant. Second, Lorraine continued, an amicable divorce. File for irreconcilable differences. You'd split your company, house, and 401. She earns less than you, so you'll likely have to provide support for her for a few years and for the children until they graduate high school. Third, Lorraine said, you could sue for alienation of affection if he is the father or for non-enforcement of a fraternization policy if he's a co-worker. If the other party is married, you could give their partner all the information about the affair. If they knew, you might have a case against them too. If they didn't, maybe I could represent them in their divorce. You could go public telling everyone, friends, family, and co-workers. You could even sell your share of the company to an offshore trust, remortgage the house, take all the equity, cash out your 401, and have a blowout in Vegas. My mind raced as I considered her options. Option one wasn't acceptable. I had been an unwilling participant in this situation for too long. Option two wasn't viable either. I had invested too much in building the business and the life we had. I wasn't willing to give her half and continue supporting her while she was with someone else. Nuclear, I said. Lorraine smiled. Okay, I'll start drawing up some paperwork. I would suggest starting some covert surveillance on her to find out who and when and where. We really need more evidence. Can I keep that phone? I asked. Seeing it does you no good, she said. I nodded and handed her the phone. Michelle and I left Lorraine's office, and she took me to a small family-run hotel where she had me booked in. Go take a shower and get some room service, she instructed. I'll be back with some things for you later. I went through the motions, my world unraveling around me. I ordered room service as if I were on a routine trip. It was the only way I could cope with the stress. Nine years of my life felt like they had been flushed away. What hurt most was how oblivious I had been. How had I not noticed what she was doing? Was it someone she had returned to after each child, or was it simply that she couldn't stay away from her lover for long? I had the minibar speculatively and was about to indulge when Michelle entered the room. Don't even think about it, she said firmly. I need you thinking, not drowning your sorrows. You need to plan, and you can't do that if you're looking at the world through the bottom of a bottle. Plan? I asked, feeling defeated. I had a plan. I had a loving wife, and two beautiful kids. Now, I don't even know if the kids are mine. My entire life has fallen apart and you want me to plan. Michelle looked at me for a moment, waiting for me to say something. When I didn't, she checked her watch and said, Okay, pity party is over. How many times, when we were building the company, did you hit a roadblock? Did your plans fail? That's got nothing to do with this, I said. I don't know, I admitted. A whole bunch. There was a time when the patent office lost the application for the inverse thread, and we got beaten to that deal. There was a time when the bank tried to foreclose on us early because they were under pressure. Okay, she said. At what point in all those times did you sit down, put your head in your hands, and give up? That was different, I said. Why, she asked. What was so different about those times? I had something to fight for then, I said. I had a family who was depending on me. You have a family now, she said, who are equally dependent on you. And it's much bigger than the family you have at home. 
There are 141 people and their families depending on you to pull through this. None of your partners are capable of keeping the company afloat. You're all engineers, but of the three of you, you're the only businessman. If you go down, the company goes down. You think that anyone else cares about the families dependent on your company. If she gets half, she will sell it off to the highest bidder and you will lose control of the business. You know who will buy it. Hatting Lu will then own everything you've worked for. Is that what you want? I stared at her. She was right. I had worked too long and too hard to let it all go to whoever offered my wife the most money. I needed to get everything in order to secure my and my family's future. If the kids were mine, I would make sure they were taken care of. As for Caroline, she had made her own choices, and she could deal with the consequences. My anger and determination gave me clarity. I sat down with Michelle and began to make plans. I was going to secure the future of the company and look after the only family I had left. Once I made that decision, everything fell into place. The hurt and indecision were gone. Michelle saw the change in my expression and nodded in satisfaction. That's the Gary I need. She said, the one who knows how to plan for the future. We spent the rest of the evening strategizing. Initially, I considered selling my shares in the company to my partners, but Michelle dismissed that idea. She believed I couldn't trust them to manage the company properly and warned that once they became majority shareholders, they would likely run it into the ground. In the end, we decided to set up an offshore trust. I would sell the company to the trust at market rates and be retained by the trust as CEO at minimum wage. Since the trust was offshore, its records would be beyond the court's jurisdiction and its owners would remain unknown. I would be a millionaire on paper once everything was finalized, but I needed to divest myself of that capital. I also needed to cash in my 401 and release all the equity in the house. Although we had bought the house together, it was in my sole name, as Caroline hadn't been working at that time. I made a list of tasks and texted my lawyer, who handled the company's legal matters, to schedule an appointment for the next day. After Michelle left, I took another shower and went to bed, not expecting to sleep much. I fell asleep almost immediately and didn't stir until the alarm on my phone woke me. The next day, there was a message from Caroline. You didn't let me know you arrived. Is everything okay? Sorry. I was planning until late and then fell asleep. Everything is coming together now. I should be back Thursday. Good, see you then. Love you. XX. I couldn't bring myself to respond. Michelle knocked on my door just after eight. I had taken another shower and was contemplating going out for breakfast. Breakfast, she said, indicating that I should follow her. We went to a diner down the street and sat in a booth eating pancakes and bacon with maple syrup. Part of me couldn't understand why I was behaving as if my world hadn't just fallen apart. I rationalized that at some point, when the dust settled, the reality of it all would hit me. I wasn't looking forward to that, but in the meantime, I had work to do. Brian Spencer, Michelle said, naming my lawyer, called and said he has a slot at 10 to see us. We can go to your bank first to cash your 401 and release the equity in your house before we go there. I see how consolidating my cash is worth doing. I said, but there's still a record of me having it all. Won't the court just order me to pay her half? Only if you still have it, Michelle said with a grin. That's where Vegas comes in. Once you have all that equity, you go and spend a week in Vegas and blow the lot all before you file for divorce. That way, when you're assessed by the courts, you'll appear to be financially poor and in debt. In fact, the bank might foreclose on your house and your salary will barely cover your living expenses. That's assuming the kids aren't yours. If they are, then you can put all your 401 can trust funds into their college funds. Caroline won't be able to touch it. She'll technically be earning more than you and might even end up having to pay you maintenance. When do you get the results of the DNA test? Michelle asked. The company said the results should be online sometime today. I said, 
picking up my phone. I checked the email from the company and clicked on the link. The page began to load, but I put my phone down. May I? I asked Michelle, pushing the phone toward her. She picked it up, looked at the screen, and scrolled a couple of times. I watched her face for any clues about what the results might be. She looked up from the phone. The results aren't ready yet, she said. The tracking says they should be in within the next 12 hours. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. Come on, she said, getting up. The bank should be open now. Releasing the equity in the house and cashing in my 401 took a remarkably short time. I closed out all of our savings accounts, including the kids' college funds, and transferred the money into an account I set up in my sole name. The only account I left alone was the joint account we used daily, which had less than $10,000 in it. My lawyer raised a concern, but if it was possible to handle it in a good way, he did. You're forgetting one thing, he said when we outlined our plan to him. I do. I asked, surprised. I hadn't realized it was a condition of the partnership agreement, he reminded me. When you started out, all partners had to have a prenuptial agreement. That protects the company in case of any breakdowns in relationships. It only covers the company, so Caroline has no claim on any company assets. For the purposes of the divorce, you're an employee of the company, so she can only claim against your salary and 401. What should I do? I asked. What I would suggest, he said, and I mean no disrespect to your divorce attorney's plan, is to use all the capital you released from the house and your 401 to invest in the company. Buy out one of your partners. I know Robert has been hinting at wanting to cash in. You don't have enough to do it, but you could take out a loan from the company pension fund to cover the difference. The payments will be taken from your salary, which will make your income appear much less when you're assessed for assets. Since everything else will be tied up in the company, it will be untouchable. Your credit rating will take a hit when the bank forecloses on your house, and you'll lose half of whatever is left in your bank account. But other than that, she'll get nothing. We can make your salary less than hers, so she might even end up paying you support. What would I have to live on? I asked. If all your salary is tied up in loan payments, you still need somewhere to live, to eat, and to support the kids. Let's wait to see about the children, he said. Have you decided what to do if they aren't yours? Will you still be involved in their lives? I don't know, I said. It's too horrible a thought to consider. I'll have to wait until I know for certain before making those kinds of decisions. Don't forget the other parts of your attorney's plan, he reminded me. I'm prepared to bet you will get enough in a settlement to pay off the loan and go back to earning your full salary once it's all done. Not to mention you can claim back expenses from the children's father if they prove not to be yours. Since that will happen after the divorce, it won't be considered part of the settlement. Can you approach Robert for me and, and see if he's interested in selling? I asked. I'm not sure I'm capable at the moment. He nodded. I'll call him and let you know. We shook hands and left his office. I felt a sense of relief as we walked out of the building, seeing the plans starting to come together. But then I remembered why we were making these plans, and my relief disappeared, replaced by a hollow ache in my chest. We were at the diner, having lunch, when I dared to look at my phone again. I couldn't bring myself to do more than click on the link in the email before passing the phone to Michelle. I watched her face, hoping for some sign about whether I was a father or not. I'm so sorry, Gary, she said gently. It was the most uncharacteristic I had ever seen her. She passed me the phone, and I read the results for myself. Neither of the children were biologically mine. Although they had the same father, it wasn't me. The double blow of losing both my children was overshadowed by the rage I felt at the betrayal. Not only had Caroline passed the two children off as mine, but she had also convinced me to have a vasectomy, meaning I couldn't father children of my own. Gary, Michelle snapped, bringing me back to myself. Now is not the time, nor is this the place. Hold it together. We will get through this, I promise. I took several deep breaths 
pushing my rage down. I had really wanted to do someone severe physical damage and had even considered hiring a professional to deal with the person who had deceived me about the children. Michelle took control once again and led me out of the diner. Lorraine called and said she wanted to see me. We headed for Lorraine's office, where she looked concerned when we entered. I have a preliminary report from the PI, she said. Apparently, Caroline didn't waste any time. A man came to your house last night and stayed the night. We couldn't see inside, but I have cameras set up. I can go swap out the flash drives, and we can review what happened. Okay, I said. I can't go back. I'm supposed to be out of town on business. Lorraine checked her phone. The au pair is at a play center with Sophie and James, she said. I'll keep an eye on her and let you know if she leaves. My house was about a 30-minute drive from Lorraine's office. Michelle drove fast, and we got there without incident. I swapped out the flash drives, took a quick look around the house, but saw nothing unusual. We then returned to Lorraine's office and reviewed the flash drives. I chose not to watch the footage from the bedroom. I didn't need to see what went on in there. I identified the man as soon as he walked through the door. As I had suspected, it was her boss, the man she had been working for all the time we had been together, Bill. The thing that nearly undid me was what happened when he arrived at the house. He had his own key and let himself in. When he arrived, James looked up and saw him. Daddy Bill. He exclaimed and ran to hug him. That undid me. I broke down and began to sob. I couldn't watch anymore. Lorraine looked on as I broke down. Michelle, for the first time ever, put her arms around me and held me while I cried. It took some time, but eventually I pulled myself together. Do you want to take some time? Lorraine asked. I shook my head. The pain had receded somewhat and the anger was re-establishing its hold. What's next? I said. I already have a copy of the employment terms and conditions at your wife's firm, Lorraine said. There is a non-fraternization policy, so you have a case against the company for breach of that. Since the person your wife is fraternizing with is a senior executive of the firm, there's no way the company can claim they didn't know what was going on. We explained to Lorraine what my company lawyer had told me and his advice. She broke out in a huge grin. She picked up the telephone and called him, asking for copies of the prenup, which he emailed to her. This is just too perfect, she said, reading the prenup. Forget everything I said before. Your lawyer's plan is exactly right. If your partner wants to divest, then the prenup. Forget everything I said before. Your lawyer's plan is exactly right. If your partner wants to divest, then buy him out. Sink everything you have into the company, which immediately puts it out of her reach. We can go after her company for non-enforcement, him for alienation of affection, and her for false declaration on a birth certificate. We can also pursue claims for the money spent on the children so far. The deductible on the medical bills alone is a sizable sum. It all depends on whether Robert wants to sell out, I said. I guess we have to wait until he comes back with an answer. Michelle dropped me back at the hotel, and I went up to the room. I was just about to sit on the bed when there was a knock on the door. I opened it to find Michelle standing in the hallway. Come on, she said. You can't stay here. What? I asked, confused. Because you need not to be alone, she said. You'll only brood or attack the minibar. I want you where I can keep an eye on you. While she was talking, she had packed up my few things. She grabbed my arm, guiding me out of the room, then checked me out and took me to her car. Where are we going? I asked, not caring much where. My place, she said. I have a spare room you can use. But I, I began. She turned her head and gave me a look. I shut up. I had never been to Michelle's house and was surprised to see that it was almost the same size as mine. Ours was over two levels, whereas hers only had a single floor. She showed me to a room with an ensuite shower and told me to get changed. She ordered dinner in, and we ate in silence. I'm guessing it was good, but I didn't really taste it. My mind was preoccupied with a maelstrom of thoughts that wouldn't settle. 
I was in a rage but couldn't find the energy to express it. I was devastated but couldn't find the energy to care. All I had the energy for right now was to execute my plans. I was on autopilot, my destination set. I was just contemplating what to do after I finished eating when my phone rang. I winced, hoping against hope that it wasn't Caroline. It wasn't. Hi, Robert. I said listlessly. Why? Was all he asked. Robert and I had been friends since university. We had trained together, and it was a project we had worked on that had given us the foundation to start the business. I had ended up with more of the company at first because I had more capital to invest than he did. Caroline is cheating on me, I said in a wooden voice. Has been all along, he asked incredulously. You mean neither of the kids are mine? I told him. There was silence from the other end of the phone. So you want to tie up all your assets in the company and hide behind the prenup? He asked. Either Robert had a far better understanding of the partnership agreement than I did, or Brian Spencer, our lawyer, had explained it well. I want to keep 5%, he said, and stay on the books as a consulting engineer. I'll discuss the details with HR. The rest is yours. Okay, I said. I'll get Brian to draw up the paperwork. Gary, he said after a moment. I'm really sorry. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but it does get easier, I promise. I've been almost exactly where you are right now, and it does get easier. It was only then that I remembered he had gone through a divorce about four years earlier. I hadn't known the details because, despite being friends, he was a very private person. I just knew it hadn't been pleasant, which was how he remembered the prenup. He had used it himself. The next morning, Michelle woke me with a cup of coffee. Come on, she said, we've still got a lot to do. Our first stop was Brian Spencer, the company lawyer. He had already gotten all the paperwork together for my buyout of Robert, and we completed that transaction in under 30 minutes. I gave him everything I had taken out of the house, out of my savings, and out of my 401. I also had to take out a loan against the company pension scheme for the balance. Now, on paper, at least I was in debt to the tune of about a million dollars. My salary was just about half of what it had been, as the payments were deducted before tax. Then we went to see Lorraine. I showed her all the paperwork from the business transaction, and she was ecstatic. This is perfect, she said. I'll file the paperwork today. We should be able to serve on Monday if you want. We'll serve him, her, and the company simultaneously. Where do you want her served? Lorraine asked. Wherever it causes her maximum embarrassment, I said. If you could do it via billboard at the Super Bowl, I'd happily pay for that. Lorraine laughed. We'll serve her at her office, she said. 10 a.m. Monday provided the papers clear the courts before then. If I file them today, I should have them back sometime tomorrow afternoon. I nodded. Now what? I looked at Michelle. She was running things now. We have two more stops before you go back to the office and pretend that you just came back from putting out a fire in Portland. Do you think you will be able to hold it together at home until Monday? I guess I'll have to. I said. Don't guess, she said. Tell me what you need to help you hold it together until then. I don't know, I said. Some good news. She smiled at me. Let's go. I was surprised when we pulled up outside the medical center, where I had all my physicals and where I had had my procedure. What are we doing here? I asked. You wanted some good news, she said. Come on. I followed her into the clinic and stood back as she went to the reception desk. The receptionist nodded and indicated for us to take a seat. We sat, and less than two minutes later, my doctor came out and invited me into a consulting room. I looked at Michelle, who had made no move to follow. Please, I said, and she nodded and accompanied me. Dr. Harrington made no comment about Michelle being involved in my consultation. He knew who she was and that she was not my wife, as he was both mine and Caroline's doctor. Why I was asking my secretary to come with me was my business, not his. Gary, he said, I understand that you wanted to ask about reversing your vasectomy. My eyes widened. 
Was that even possible? I looked at Michelle, who had the tiniest of smiles on her face. Yes, Dr. Harrington said. It is possible. Since your vasectomy was under three years ago, there is a success rate of about 95% for reversal. The operation is a bit longer than the original procedure and involves a general anesthetic, but I'm confident that you will be able to father children again once we are done. Once again, my eyes filled with tears. I still have a chance at fatherhood. It would mean surgery, but that was a small price to pay if it meant that I could have my own children. I had no idea who I would be having children with, but at least it was possible. I know it's a lot to take in, said the doctor. Here is some information about the surgery and the costs. Sadly, it wouldn't be covered by your insurance. If you want to go ahead, let me know, and we can schedule you in for a workup, the doctor said. Thank you, doctor, Michelle said, taking the information from him. We'll be in touch. I stood and allowed Michelle to lead me from the clinic and back to her car. Is that good enough news? She asked, smiling softly. On impulse, I embraced her and expressed my gratitude. Then I realized what I had done and quickly stepped back. I am so sorry, I said. Gary, she said gently, it's okay. We got into her car. One more stop, then back to the office, she said. I had been to Bill Waywright's house a number of times during the years Caroline had worked for him. He and his wife, Stephanie, lived in a nice area just outside the city in a gated community. They had hosted some company functions there. Why are we here? I asked. Michelle got out of the car and walked to the door of the house. I followed her. She didn't even have to knock. Stephanie had been informed by the guard that we were on our way over, and she was waiting at the door. Gary, she greeted me. You must be Michelle. Was it you that called? It was, Michelle answered. Come in, Stephanie said, leading us to a room that looked like an office just off the entrance hall. It was Bill's office, judging by the pictures on the desk and wall. Stephanie settled behind the desk and indicated the chairs opposite suggesting this was not a personal visit. How can I help you? Stephanie asked. I sat there staring at her, unable to speak. Finally, I asked, did you know? Stephanie sighed sadly. No, I suspected, but I never knew for sure. I could never find any proof, nothing I could take to a lawyer. Otherwise, I would have taken him to court for every penny he has. Get in line, Michelle growled. Do you have proof? Stephanie asked, and I nodded. Proof that neither of my kids are mine, that they share a father. Video of him and Caroline at my house, my son calling him dad. I said, my voice breaking. I couldn't finish that sentence, and once again, I was overwhelmed with emotion. Oh, Gary, I'm so sorry, Stephanie said. I had suspected for years, but he was so careful, she said. I had suspected for years, but he was so careful. I had him followed, checked his phone, his email. I even confronted him about it, but he convinced me I was just being paranoid. The PI I used came up empty. I promise, if I had been certain, if I had any proof, I would have come to you right away. I didn't want to destroy what looked like a happy marriage based on mere suspicion. I needed to be sure, and I never managed to get any evidence. What are you going to do now? I wondered if I should tell Stephanie my plans. I didn't know if she would inform Bill immediately. It was probably too late for him to do anything meaningful, but I wanted it to be a big shock for him, just as it had been for me. Now that you have proof, Stephanie said, what are you going to do? I'm not sure if I should be telling you this, I said. I understand, Stephanie said with a small smile, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't tell me either. If you have the name of a good divorce lawyer, I would appreciate it. Michelle pulled a card out of her purse and handed it to her. Thank you, Stephanie said. Will a week be enough time? I nodded. Perfect, Stephanie said. I'll contact her and coordinate with her. Stephanie stood, signaling that our meeting was over. Michelle and I also stood. Stephanie gave me a brief hug and a peck on the cheek. Once again... I'm so sorry, she said. Look after him, she directed at Michelle, 
who had stiffened slightly. He deserves better than what was done to him. We returned to the office, and I spent the rest of the day catching up on work that I had missed while I was in Portland. At the end of the day, catching up on work that I had missed while I was in Portland. At the end of the day, Michelle knocked on my door, told me she was leaving for the evening, and returned to her professional demeanor. I felt a pang of loss. I had thought I was starting to get a bit closer to her, but perhaps that was just my imagination. I thanked her for all her help. I worked late at the office, catching up on tasks. Caroline's text came in around 8 p.m. What time will you be home? She asked. Probably another hour or two. Got some catching up to do after my trip. I'll probably be asleep then. I have an early start in the morning. Love you. XX. I couldn't bring myself to answer the text. I continued to work until almost 11 p.m., hoping she would be asleep by the time I got home. The less interaction with her, the better. When I arrived home, the house was dark. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I checked on Sonia and James. They were both asleep, looking as adorable as ever. A sob welled up in my chest, and I had to go hide in the bathroom. I couldn't let Caroline catch me weeping over children who were not even mine. I still hadn't decided what to do about the kids. It was unlikely that either of them would remember me if I just walked away. I had no formal responsibility to them, but I loved them both all the same. How could I abandon them when less than 48 hours ago, they were my children, my pride and joy. Now they were just further proof of my wife's infidelity. I decided to wait and see what transpired. The decision might be taken out of my hands. I went to bed, doing my best not to wake Caroline. It took me a long time to fall asleep, and when my alarm woke me the next morning, Caroline was already gone. The nanny was in the kitchen feeding the children when I entered. I looked at her, wondering if she knew. There's no way she didn't. Was she now looking at me and laughing at the situation? Did she know the children weren't even mine? My mind wandered, and I had troubling thoughts about her and Caroline's past interactions with Bill Wright as the children cried in the next room. I shook my head angrily. I decided that come Monday, I would take great pleasure in firing her. I would make sure she would not work as a nanny again. I realized I was taking my anger out on someone who had little control over the situation. If she had told me, she would have lost her job and could have left. However, she seemed to care for the kids whom she had looked after since before Sonia was born. I was lashing out, probably at the wrong person. At work, Michelle was already in the office when I arrived. It was as if the previous couple of days had not happened. She was all business, and I noted from my planner that she had cleared my day for what she labeled as marketing. I got settled in my office, and she brought in my morning coffee as she had done every day for the past nine years. She also brought herself a coffee, something she had never done before. Marketing. I asked, since when do I do marketing? She grinned. We have to plan the last part of Lorraine's strategy. I looked at her, puzzled. What's that? Tell everyone, she said. Friends, family, church groups, volunteer groups. Anyone and everyone she interacts with needs to know what she's been doing. It won't paint me in the best light, but if you don't get your story out first, Caroline will, and that will be much worse. I'll be a laughingstock, I said. A man who can't even keep his wife satisfied, raising another man's children. You have to get your story out there, Michelle insisted. If you don't, Caroline will paint you as an abusive husband or someone who mistreats children. People might believe that, and when we go public, she'll hit back with everything she has. Get your side out first, and people will be less likely to believe any counterclaims. Michelle put together a media pack with all the proof we had about Caroline's infidelity, the private investigator's report, copies of the DNA tests showing that I was not the father of the children, and videos from my house, including footage of Bill interacting with the kids. Later that morning, I received an email from Lorraine. She had received a sample of Bill's DNA from Stephanie and had confirmed he was definitely the father of both children. 
I included this new information in the media pack, which would be sent to Caroline's parents, my parents, and Caroline's siblings. Electronic copies were also sent to all her Facebook and LinkedIn contacts, along with anyone else I could think of. I arranged for the media pack to be delivered at 10 a.m. on Monday, the time when the revelations were set to be made public. I only had to get through the weekend, which I had planned for as well. As an engineer, it took me less than an hour to design and build a small device with a motor, timer, and battery. I set it so that the motor would create a jarring vibration after a certain amount of time. On Friday night, after the nanny had left, I secretly placed the device under Sophie's pillow. It was set to go off at 6 o'clock the next morning, around the time we would normally wake up. This would ensure that our usual weekend morning routine was disrupted. The device worked perfectly. I was woken by Sophie coming into our room and climbing into bed with us. So our usual weekend morning routine was interrupted. I smiled to myself, managing to keep busy all day Saturday with the household tasks Caroline had been asking me to do for months. When she commented on it, I simply mentioned that it was about time I took care of them, given how much she had been reminding me. Saturday night, Caroline, unusually, tried to be intimate, but I pretended to be asleep when she came out of the bathroom. On Sunday, her daughter once again woke up early, startled by the device I had set up. We decided to take the kids to the zoo for the day. Throughout the day, there were moments when I looked at Caroline, the woman I had loved and thought loved me in return, and the children I had cherished, only to realize they weren't mine. I struggled to keep my emotions in check, biting my cheek until it bled, but I made it through the weekend. On Monday, I was eager. I told Caroline I would be working from home and wanted to speak to the nanny. Caroline left for work at her usual time, poking her head into my office to say goodbye. I pretended to be engrossed in an email and just grunted in response. Once she left, I looked at my watch. It was 8.15. The nanny knocked on my office door, wanting to take the children to the play center, but I said no, they needed to stay at home. She was surprised, as I had never refused her before, but she nodded and went back to the children. I heard James get upset, having wanted to go. Around nine o'clock, Michelle arrived at the house, which surprised me, but I let her in. For the first time, I made coffee for her. We had a teleconference with Lorraine at 9.30. Gary, Lorraine said, this is your last chance to reconsider. If you have any second thoughts, now is the time to speak up. I have no second thoughts, I said. Then I'll see you on the other side, Lorraine replied. It was on. I watched my email account for confirmation of service emails. At exactly 10 a.m., the first arrived, the second about three minutes later, and the third five minutes after that. Then my phone rang. It wasn't Caroline, as I had expected. It was my mother. Hi, Mom, I answered. What's going on? She asked. You read the packet I sent? I asked. Yes, but then you know, she said. Read the packet I sent? I asked. Yes, but then you know as much as I do, I said. Caroline has been cheating on me, probably my whole married life, with her boss. The kids are not mine. I'm divorcing her. Gary, can't you? She said. No, Mom, I can't. I have to go. I have other calls coming in. I hung up. The phone rang again immediately. This time, it was Caroline. Gary, we need to talk, she said. I didn't answer, waiting for her to continue. I'm coming home, she said, and ended the call. Caroline is on her way, I told Michelle. I'll get out of your way. Michelle offered to stay, but I wasn't sure how to ask her. I just looked at her as she said, call me when you know what's happening, and left. Caroline arrived about twenty minutes later. I heard her car pull up, but she didn't even bother to park in the garage. I didn't know what to expect when she entered the house, whether she would come in aggressively or quietly. She entered my office and sat down opposite me at the desk. Gary, I, she began, not interested. I cut her off. You lied to me for nine years. Neither of the kids are mine. 
yet you convinced me to get a vasectomy while you were still taking birth control so you could continue your affair with Bill. Her eyes widened. So, no, Caroline, I continued. I have no interest in what you have to say. My lawyer's contact information is in the packet you received. If you have anything you think I need to know, talk to her. If you have anything you think I need to know, talk to her. What about the children? She asked. What children? I responded. I don't have any children. If it were up to you, I wouldn't have any. I don't want to hear any more lies or excuses. I just want this whole mess to be over so I can move on with my life. I called the nanny into the room, knowing she could hear me since my office door was open. You're fired. I said, effective immediately. Pack your things and leave. What? She said. Why? Because you covered for her, I said, pointing at Caroline. You knew she was involved with her boss. I have video evidence of you talking to Bill about the children. Get out. Gary, you can't fire her. I paid her wages, Caroline argued. The nanny looked at Caroline with a look of gratitude in her eyes. Well, I said, I've already contacted the agency to inform them of your involvement in the affair and that you won't be taking any further action against them. So if Caroline wants to keep you unpersonally, not only will she have to pay you, but she will also need to handle all the additional responsibilities like your tax obligations, holidays, pension, sickness, and insurance, I said. The nanny's face drained of color. Not only was she losing her job, but being removed from the agency's roster would make it nearly impossible for her to find another position as agencies share information about their staff. Now get out, I said firmly, and she quickly left. Did you have to do that? Caroline said, her voice tinged with frustration. You're talking again. I replied. I told you I didn't want to hear it. What I do want is for you to pack your things, take the kids, and leave. This is my house too, she said. Not according to the paperwork, I countered. It's in my name. So until the courts decide otherwise, you need to leave. She flinched when I raised my voice. James came into the room, saying, Mommy, Sonia fell down. Caroline, with a stunned expression and tears on her cheeks, went to check on her daughter. I closed my office door and stayed inside while she gathered her things. After a few minutes, she returned with Sonia in her arms. Are you going to say goodbye to them? She asked. Don't say it, I said. She's not my daughter, and he's not my son. Take them to Bill and let him take care of them. They have nothing to do with me. Gary, I... Get out, I said, interrupting her. I heard the front door close, and after a few minutes her car drive away. I released the breath I had been holding. I was overwhelmed with emotion and was startled when Michelle's arms wrapped around me. As I broke down, resting my head in my hands, Michelle held me close. It took me a while to calm down. I felt like I had lost nine years of my life, my marriage, and everything I had built. Michelle took charge. Come on, she said. Lorraine mentioned it would take about four hours for Caroline to obtain an emergency occupation order since she has the kids and this is the marital home. Do you really want to give her the satisfaction of throwing you out of your own home? We gathered some of my clothes and important paperwork. I would need to find a place to stay. But for now, I loaded my belongings into both mine and Michelle's cars and left. Initially, we went to the office where I was served. Later that day, Lorraine called to inform me about the service. There was not only an occupation order but also a restraining order, meaning I wasn't allowed within 100 yards of the house. If I wanted to retrieve anything, I would need to make an appointment and be accompanied by Caroline's lawyer at my expense. Without fully grasping the situation, I found myself moving into Michelle's spare room. All my clothing was stored in her wardrobe, and my paperwork was neatly filed in the office. It had been a week since Caroline had been served. Clothing was stored in her wardrobe, and my paperwork was neatly filed in the office. It had been a week since Caroline had been served. I spent the time working and then returning to Michelle's house for meals and rest. She brought me coffee in the morning, made breakfast, 
and we traveled to the office together. Despite the difficult circumstances, nothing seemed to change between us. She remained professional, and other than the hug when I had broken down at my house, I hadn't smiled at her. On Monday, we had an appointment with the lawyers from the company where Caroline and Bill worked. I wasn't fully aware of the details, but we were apparently suing for a sum the company could barely afford. They had insurance, but it was capped at a million, and we were seeking more than that. Their lawyers were very businesslike, while Lorraine, my lawyer, was almost gleeful. What will it take to settle this? Asked one of their lawyers. Immediate and permanent termination with loss of pension for the senior party involved, Lorraine said, as well as keeping Caroline on the payroll for at least three years and an additional $1.5 million. I wasn't fully engaged as they negotiated back and forth. Eventually, they agreed to all of the above, but I would only receive about $750,000. That amount would cover a significant portion of the debt I owed to the company pension fund to be paid after the divorce was finalized. Later, Lorraine and I met with Bill's lawyers. I left their office $500,000 richer, which would cover the pension fund loan completely and leave me with a substantial amount of money after the divorce. My final appointment of the day was with Caroline's lawyers. Caroline was present, but avoided making eye contact as I entered. Michelle and Lorraine accompanied me. This accounting on the divorce petition is ridiculous. Caroline's lawyer began. Your client is a majority shareholder and CEO of a company worth approximately $20 million, not to mention the assets in the house, savings, and 401 k I suggest, he started. Let me stop you there, said Lorraine, pulling out a sheath of papers from her briefcase. The company is out of scope for the divorce as per the prenuptial agreement signed by all parties. My client recently made a significant investment in the company, depleting the majority of his savings, including his 401k, and taking a loan against the house. He also had to take a loan from the company pension fund. One of the partners wanted to divest, and it was crucial to prevent those shares from falling into the hands of a competitor who has been trying to take over the business for some time. Given the reduced salary from the pension fund loan, he is now paid less than your client. I will be asking the courts for some sort of maintenance agreement to support him while he finds his footing. What about the children? Asked her lawyer. There is DNA proof that those children are not his, Lorraine replied. She knowingly falsified birth records to show my client as the father with the intent to defraud. Additionally, we are looking into seeking damages for the significant impact of her convincing him to undergo a surgical procedure, believing he was the father of the children. The alternative is that your client accepts the divorce petition, as is, packs her things, and vacates the marital home. She will receive half of the joint account, which currently stands at $9,000, $443.15. Her lawyer reviewed the paperwork, the prenuptial agreement, and then looked at Caroline. For the first time, Caroline made eye contact with me. Gary, please, she said. Nine years, I responded. You lied to me every single day. You have nothing to say that I want to hear. Caroline looked at her lawyer and nodded. She signed the papers. I wasn't present when she moved out of the house. I received an email from her lawyers informing me that the restraining order had been lifted and that the house was now mine. I considered moving back in but decided against it. Instead, I put the house on the market. It didn't quite cover the outstanding balance owed to the bank, but I made up the difference and the bank was satisfied. Two months later, I was still living in Michelle's spare room. After our divorce, Caroline moved in with her parents who, despite all the evidence, remained on her side and refused to speak to me. It was no loss, though. For some reason, Stephanie had not divorced Bill as she had promised. I had no interest in finding out why, especially since he had lost his job and pension. They had to sell their house in the gated community and move to a smaller apartment. Bill managed to find a reasonable job with his remaining contacts and skills, although it was not the same as before. I hadn't seen Caroline since that day in her lawyer's office, and I had no desire to. 
One day, while at my desk at work, Michelle knocked and entered without waiting for a reply. Bill Wainwright is dead, she said without preamble. What? I asked. Apparently, Stephanie caught him with Caroline again. She shot him, Michelle explained. I leaned back in my chair, a grin spreading across my face. I tried to control it, but found it difficult. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy, I said eventually. Michelle laughed. Am I evil for being happy about it? I asked. Not at all, Michelle said. That scoundrel got what he deserved. Oh, by the way, this was just delivered, she added, dropping an official-looking envelope on my desk. I looked at it with trepidation, knowing what it contained. I opened it and looked at the contents. That's it, I said. I'm finally a free man. Finally, Michelle agreed. Then, to my surprise, she kissed me. It wasn't a brief kiss, but rather a full, heartfelt kiss that left me breathless and amazed. When she finally pulled away, she looked down and saw my reaction. For nine years, she said, I've taken care of you. You are the most perfect man I have ever met. Not once did you ever make an advance, and I loved you for it. I have waited for you for nine years, and now that you're free, I want to show you that not all women are deceitful. Please give me a chance. I was stunned, reflecting on all the time I had spent with her before I learned about the infidelity. I had defended her fiercely against my business partner, even to the point of having him removed from the business. I realized then that I had real feelings for Michelle. It seemed inevitable that working closely with someone for so long would lead to deeper emotions, and now, with the divorce behind me, those feelings were clear. Say something, she said, a look of worry on her face. It was the first time I had ever seen her uncertain. How many? I asked. She looked puzzled. How many what? Children, I said. How many children should we have? Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.